Hey Internet, welcome to Review Everlasting, uh, interim edition of your favorite YouTube addiction. You can see behind me kind of the state of the studio. It's 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 a catastrophe. There there it it's a total it's a catastrophe. It's not there yet. But uh this week we have an interesting thing too with Greek Tuesday in that we're going back into Mark finally after being out of Mark for like ever theoretically in it all year now we got a string of mark going all the way through the summer and so i'm looking at a video we did back in january 6 i think we released it which is like a summary of mark and it really is better than anything i'm going to give you from the text proper today uh the text for this week is mark chapter 3 verses 22 to 36 which is some pretty important stuff blasphemy against the holy spirit and jesus mother and his brothers thinking he's got a demon or that he's crazy or something, which is kind of important because in the book of Mark, if you're an unbeliever, Jesus is nuts. Like that's the whole point. He is a terrifying, crazy man, spirit driven, spirit possessed to the point which you're like, he's got Beelzebub in him. He has the prince of demons in him. This guy is so nuts. He thinks he's God. And that's one of the major thrusts of Mark's gospels that either he is or he's not, right? But he thinks he is. You can't, you can't get around that. So anyway, Go ahead and watch that video. It's better than anything I'm going to give you today. And you're going to have to let your pastor explain blasphemy against the Holy Spirit for you. Hint, hint, it's unbelief as in, I hate Jesus, he can go to hell. Well, okay, fine, you just blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You can't be saved without that. It's not a one-time sin you do and then you're unsaved forever. It is that on the last day, you don't have the Holy Spirit creating faith in Jesus in you. That is the one thing that is unforgivable because it's rejecting forgiveness itself. But your pastor can explain that to you. Uh, enjoy this video. It's, it's pretty good. Peter did a good job editing. It's old school, which is new school, which is better school than this school, but hopefully we'll get there eventually. And uh, yeah, yeah, we'll catch you guys later. Oh, we'll catch you at the Issues Etc. Conference in just a couple weeks. I know you're headed there. You're signed up. You're ready to go. And five bucks a month makes this all get better faster. I promise. Really. Ninja clan. Look, there's a ninja right here. It goes on your bottle to make the fizz stay in and it doesn't work. But he's cute. Yeah. Rock on. <laughs> Would you have a lasting cover today? Hey Internet, we're back with a little bit more Greek Tuesday, only because we're supposed to be in Mark and because the text for this coming week isn't Mark, we're going to do something just a little bit different for this week. We're going to go and give you an overview of the themes and structures and ideas of Mark. This is something we recorded a little while back and didn't have room to fit it in, but it's such good content. Rather than repeating the text from Mark 1, which is actually assigned for this week, which was preached on and taught just a couple weeks ago, we're going to give you these digs instead, yeah? So, hope you enjoy. Make sure. You stick around. So with the end of November and the early part of December, in the church, if you're at a church that in any way follows kind of the history of being church, you're going to see the church year flipping over from last year to this year. With that, you also tend to have the three-year lectionary series, a shift in the gospel of focus. Every year in the three-year focus is more or less on one of the three synoptics that is looking similar gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Although Mark's so short that the year of Mark ends up being the year of John a whole lot of the time. You never really get a year of John, which is kind of a bummer in its own right. But in any case, what this means is we're going to be getting a whole lot of Mark for the next, well, I don't know, year. Ha. And I'm kind of looking forward to that because of this commentary by a guy named James Veltz, a professor at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. One thing I remember from my last year at seminary was his class on the synoptics in which he opened up the book of Mark to me in ways I had never thought possible. The, kind of the standard run on the book of Mark is, oh, this was this early sort of proto gospel written by a dumb, uneducated man who just wrote down as much as he could as fast as he could because he was in a hurry and didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> And Veltz kind of takes a different approach to this, that Mark is not early, but kind of late as writing of Gospels goes, and it's all very intentional, highly structured, and sophisticated. And you know, it, it, it is. It, it's a beautiful thing. It's so beautiful. <laughs> but being that I didn't take notes and I was just in awe as a fourth year and really wanting to graduate and not really do homework anyway. Beer, 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 bad, bad. 
I've always like when I come to Mark been like I know this book's amazing But I don't know how to see it So I was really excited that this got published because it's like he's gonna put it in paper form so I can go back and read it So that's what I'll be doing a bunch as I can this year Sadly, it only goes to chapter 8 and there's a lot more, you know, that's like twice as much, right? But we're gonna pull some of what I'm gonna do next directly out of this because one of the best parts of the book is the opening section in which he details the themes and unique characteristics of Mark the things which make it set apart which you want to see so you don't think like the liberal scholars of the scholastic romantics 1800s that Mark didn't know what he was doing right and probably had a bunch of mistakes in it anyway right no this is the inspired and errant and intentional word of God crafted by the Holy Spirit through the humanity of this particular author the traveling companion of Saint Peter Mark now of course there are some linguistic features of Mark's gospel that I'm not gonna spend too much time on now but Vels goes into great detail on this he's a grammarian at heart most noticeably the use of the word and Kai in the Greek and the word euthus uh, immediately or right away or uh, on the moment now Vels goes into quite a bit of detail as to why the use of these words might be the way that they are but I think his best answer is that they are signifiers of the fact that this gospel is not intentionally a chronologic gospel unlike the book of Luke whereas Luke's gospel conforms to the forms of writing in his day that you might have called historiography that is just writing an account of orderly details of a life in the order that they happened and where Matthew interestingly enough corresponds more to a Greek style of writing called the bios or the life story Mark's gospel ends up looking a lot more like a classic Greek tragedy or drama in which the focal point is the hero and his death due to his unwillingness to bend on some particular point of his identity called in Greek drama the flaw although don't hear that as the imperfection so much as the thing that gets him killed right and that's exactly what mark's like all about like jesus just refuses to not be god and it gets him killed i can just push it push it but as a result, the concern is not so much about the newspaper account of this happened, then this happened, then this happened, is that all these things happened and they lead to this other thing. Yeah, the death, right? And then there's the question of the resurrection. Well, we'll have to take up that at another time. But let's keep moving here. What is Mark about? It's about the protagonist, this guy named Jesus, who in Mark is quite different than the guy Jesus we see in the other Gospels. Now, this isn't to say they're different Jesuses, right? I like the Christmas Jesus best and I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whoever you want. This is a different look or a different perspective of who this Jesus is. And in one sense, Mark is writing about the Jesus who the unbeliever kind of has to see if they're honest, yeah? The Jesus who even would say to his own disciples, are you hard of heart? Are you unbelievers? This is the hard, angry, powerful Jesus who's come to do warfare with evil and who none of us really get, even when we do get him. Well, we have our flesh dragging us down into unbelief. Right off the bat, we see Jesus is a man of authority and power. He exudes authority when he teaches and he commands nature and reality to submit to him and it does. This, I guess, for us in our age of superheroes might lead us to think, wow, that's pretty cool, but in the book, it leads him to be feared. People are bothered by what this man can do. They're, they're in shock and awe. What? And rightly so. Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Well, Mark clearly portrays this man as then being God. He is divine. He is a man who carries within him the powers of heaven itself. Although interestingly, the people who are watching this who are afraid of him don't quite understand that. You know who does understand it? The demons. The demons who get into conflict with him right away. We'll come back to that too in a second. Along with Jesus being someone who is fully divine and to be feared, we also see probably the most human Jesus of any of the gospel representations. This is a guy who gets angry when people don't listen to him. A guy who doesn't know who touched him when he feels power go out from him when someone touches his garment. A guy who is unable to do a miracle in a certain area because of their unbelief. A guy who moans and sighs. A guy who takes two tries to heal a blind man. Huh, what? And then, as if we didn't need anything to make matters worse, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is just weird. He's an oddball. He's a loony. He's idiosyncratic. He heals a guy of his leprosy and then berates him and casts him out. He tells a man he heals not to tell anyone about it, and when he does and people come to him, he like flees and leaves and gets the heck out of town. Even though he's constantly saying, I've come here to preach to people. Huh? When Jesus is walking on water in the middle of the night and the disciples see him, he's trying to go by them. Like, he doesn't want them to see him. He's, like, on introvert status. And then the whole thing about the cursing of the fig tree in Jerusalem, while it's a really awesome symbol about the unbelief of Israel, is also something that happens when it's not even the time of the year for figs. And so the poor tree... <laughs> 
I mean, what did it do? More than any of this, Mark portrays Jesus as spirit-possessed, if not crazy. I mean, if you saw a guy walking around having conversations with demons inside of people, you'd think he was kind of nuts too. And he can't miss how after his baptism, the spirit of God falls upon him and drives him with violence out into the desert to confront the devil. His relatives and his family, they come to have him locked up. Take him away. So we've got this really strange protagonist, this bizarre savior, this God in human flesh, who has to deal with a bunch of disciples who in this book are portrayed pretty dang poorly. They just like never get it, ever. Trying is the first step towards failure. To the point where, as I said a moment ago, he wonders out loud if they're unbelievers. Hear you nothing that I say. Meanwhile, he's at conflict with almost everybody, almost all the time. The leadership of the Jews are seeking to destroy him. The demonic forces of the age are marshaled against him and calling him out by name. And even his family thinks he's nuts. Yeah! All of this while there's no actual chronology in the early story. It's just piece of story, piece of story, piece of story. Combined with a strong urgency to have this gospel preached. Every piece of that story is moving fast and hit from every side by conflict, conflict, conflict. While he also takes the time to conceal the gospel regularly. Don't tell people I'm the Messiah. I preach so that they might see and not understand. I'm going to go hide on a hilltop and get away from you people. But I don't have a problem talking to the demons personally. I know you. Hey, yeah. Yeah, yeah, hmm. Gonna crush you though. All of this combines to make a couple of strange things happen. It's actually very difficult to outline the story in a Western style structure like we would expect with a beginning and an end and so forth, which is where this whole drama idea is like the closest that at least Veltz can come. And I think he's got a point. You also have an issue of what's called intercalation. That is where stories fit inside of other stories. And Mark does this more than the other gospel writers do. So he'll start one story and then have another story and then finish the, other, the first story at the end, usually to make a point within that scene. And meanwhile, as fast as the gospel's moving and as short as it is, the stories that Mark does tell are more packed with details and information than the same stories found in other synoptics. As I mentioned other synoptics, it's important that we do not read too much of Matthew and Luke into Mark. That's again a bad habit of liberal scholasticism to see Mark as sort of a poor man's Matthew. That Mark just kind of jotted stuff down that Matthew picked it up and made it, you know, good for the church. And they believed at the time that all of this was happening significantly later than the actual events of the writing that we know now from dating paper and the study of what's called textual criticism. That's not criticizing the content, but criticizing the manuscripts to try to figure out, you know, what the original manuscript said and whatnot. So it's real important that as you read Mark, you read Mark as Mark and for Mark. It's important that you reread Mark, right? And don't let the other information of the other gospels skew too much what you think Mark is doing. Mark is doing his own thing. Now, he's preaching the catechism. He's preaching the gospel of Jesus. He's not going to deny the law, but he's doing it with his own style. And it's a pretty sweet style because you got a Jesus who on the one hand is crazy, on the other hand you want to follow as he marshals his armies against the gates of hell. He is the prototypical hero leader going off to battle calling to you and you want to scream at his disciples, why don't you guys get it? Let's go, right? And that's kind of the perlocutionary force, the thrust that this is supposed to be having on us Christians as we read it. All of this culminating then at the moment when Jesus is abandoned and alone. His family's left him, his disciples have fled, Peter has denied him, and in Mark's gospel alone even even God the Father leaves him. It is only in Mark's gospel that you hear Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And those are his only words on the cross. And yet through it all, there's one other beautiful golden thread running through the story. It is the fact that if Jesus says something's going to happen, it does. His words always come to pass. Whenever Jesus says something will be, it will be, and it does, which makes it all the more important that he says before he goes to die, that he is going to rise. And that even though there is no clear appearance of the resurrection in the original text of the manuscript. There's that whole issue with Mark 16. You can look it up somewhere and find plenty of information on that. You do have the angel relaying to the women Jesus' words, I will meet you in Galilee. And because everything he said has come true up to this point, you can know that part's going to come true too. Having the effect of the whole point of the gospel, which interestingly is a Johannine thought. You think you believe because you see? No, 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 no. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe because that's true faith. True faith which comes not from experience, right? Even those who were with him did not know who he was when he was doing 
power and miracles all over the place. What does it take? It takes trusting his words, his words which come to you and prove true time and time again. A divine protagonist, a frail human, a strange and scary dude who does all things well and yet people think he's crazy. A hard to follow plot and a hero who's reclusive. The one thing this gospel will not give you is a chance to understand before you believe. In the gospel of Mark, seeing is not believing, but hearing the word of God, that is. Did I tell you Mark was awesome? I mean, Mark is awesome. I can't wait. This is going to be a good year, except here's the problem. We're going to be in John like this. And John's pretty awesome too, but ah, oh man, I wish I could just go through Mark. It's so good. Until next time, we hope you like what we do here at Worldview Everlasting. Get in the gospel of Jesus Christ out into the world in no uncertain terms. You can help this by sending $5 a month to our Lutheran Ninja clan. Helps pay the bills around here. And also we're preparing for larger things in the future. Without you, this internet outreach couldn't take place and we're glad to have you on board. Meanwhile, as you know, even though you might not be yourself a divine protagonist, slightly mad, but also the savior of the world, it is important that until next time, you rock on. <laughs> <laughs> Too much! That's <laughs> what it means! <laughs>